So I've had a lot of fun talking about the complete history of the Earth. And I gotta admit, considering how limited the information is that we have to go on, I'm really impressed with how much all of you seem to have liked this concept. Because of the fact that I was starting at the very beginning, I was definitely expecting that series to have a slow start when it comes to views. But damn, looking at the numbers, it seems almost like you guys like hearing me talk about the Earth before there was even anything alive on it, even more so than you like my museum adventures. However, like I said in the very first video in that series, I don't plan to just keep making videos for the History of the Earth series every single week until it's done. I would probably be basically dedicating the next six solid months to making videos just about that if I did that. But this week I wanted to do something different. And you all seem to really like the videos when I answer a question that one of you asks in the comments. And I was asked a pretty good one in the comments of last week's video, so we're gonna do that. And if you read the title, then you already know what the question is. This is meant to be a companion piece to my very first video, where I asked, why did crocodiles survive and dinosaurs die out? I would have just answered this question in a reply, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there was actually a lot more to discuss here than at face value. And since I'm currently still stuck in the Archean as a cyanobacteria, we might as well do something different this week. So let's get into it and answer the question, why didn't the dinosaurs re-evolve after the mass extinction? As I've talked about before, the end of the Cretaceous is the most well-known mass extinction that has ever taken place. It's the one that came in the form of an asteroid striking the Yucatan Peninsula and ended the Mesozoic Era. This would be the end of the line for over three quarters of the biodiversity of the Earth at that time. The dinosaurs were the most noteworthy casualties, with 99% of the species in the clay dinosauria being wiped out in a seemingly short period of time. In fact, if you look at the fossil layers, it looks almost like they died in an instant. What I mean by this is, in certain places around the world where there are rock layers dated to 66 million years ago, you will see a clear and noticeable band in the rock. This band is made of a layer of vaporized particles that came from an asteroid. And we know this because, after testing the mineral composition of the layer, it was found to contain high levels of iridium. Iridium is a rare material here on Earth but commonly found in asteroids. And what's even more interesting about this is the fact that below this layer, you can find dinosaur fossils, but above this layer, you don't find any dinosaur fossils at all. However, I did say 99% of the dinosaurs died. One group that obviously did pull through were the ancestors of all modern birds. But besides that, there were several other groups of animals that did make it. Other reptiles like snakes, lizards, and turtles all survived, as well as the previously mentioned crocodilians, and many different species of invertebrates, amphibians, and most importantly for us, the mammals. But the thing to remember was that no group of life forms was unaffected by this disaster. Every clade lost most or all of its largest and most dominant species, to the point where pretty much all of the animals that weighed over 100 pounds were gone. So basically when the asteroid hit, it was basically like hitting the reset button on the food web. The overwhelming dominance of a few groups had ended, and moving forward, the ones that remained would all be on an equal playing field in the struggle for survival. Extinction level disasters suck, but oftentimes what follows is an explosion in biodiversity. And we've talked about this, this is called adaptive radiation. It's what led to the wildly bizarre creatures of the Triassic, and then what allowed the diversification of the dinosaurs after they got wiped out. And I know that the common mindset has been that we mammals inherited the world from the ashes of the dinosaurs, and we were totally unopposed in our conquest. But the reality is actually way more complicated than that. As we enter the Paleocene, the different clades would all be on equal footing, and it really was anybody's game. And the winners of this game would be decided not by an extinction event that caused this power vacuum, but by the changes to the environment as different groups of animals radiated into different forms. 
And to be honest, the Earth actually seemed like it was going to remain under the control of the reptiles through the beginning of the Cenozoic, because as the world recovered from the impact, the world became drastically warmer and more humid. This was the type of environment that the Earth was like during the Carboniferous or the Jurassic. And the main animals that benefited the most from this type of global ecosystem are exothermic animals like reptiles and arthropods. Endothermic groups like mammals and birds aren't really at a disadvantage in this type of environment. And everyone tends to benefit from more abundant food, and that's pretty much what tropical ecosystems tend to provide. But it's the exotherms that actually benefit from the climate itself in these types of situations. And we know that during the Eocene and Paleocene, the world was covered in swamps and tropical forests from pole to pole. And as a result, that's why it would actually be the reptiles that were the first to grab control. Just four million years after every large animal on Earth died, we would see the biggest snake to ever exist evolve in South America that being Titanoboa. And that's a monster that deserves its own video for sure. And, but it wasn't actually the only giant reptile from the Sarahan jungles of Paleocene Colombia. There was a giant turtle called Carbonomies and a multitude of massive 20 plus foot crocodilians. Now all these animals shared their environment with each other as well as our still small underdog ancestors. During the course of the Mesozoic, the dinosaurs evolved into a staggering number of varieties. Most of the megafaunal roles were filled by them, and they literally adapted to every environment on Earth. And the lineage that would eventually lead to birds had already evolved during the Jurassic. However, the early avian dinosaurs ran into a bit of a problem when they started to evolve flight. This put them in direct competition with the already established rulers of the sky, the pterosaurs and birds would largely be kept down by them the same way that large dinosaurs would keep our ancestors down. There are a few exceptions to this, but in broad terms, birds were mostly in a similar boat to mammals. And just like with the mammals, their luck would change after the extinction removed 99% of the dinosaurs, because it also would remove 100% of the pterosaurs. And in the global greenhouse that followed, the birds would have the same opportunities and challenges presented to them as with our ancestors. And we see the birds actually start to evolve a similar body plan to large theropods in many different groups by giving up flight and becoming bipedal land animals once again. One of the earliest examples of this was a large bird called Gastornis, a 500 pound behemoth of its time that for over a century we believe had been a vicious predator that preyed on tiny cat sized horses with alcohol dependency issues. Throughout the afternoon, they have continued to eat the fermenting grapes off the ground. They contain only the smallest amount of alcohol, but it is enough to dull their usually sharp senses. However, it's now widely believed that these guys were actually herbivores and used their powerful beaks to feed on nuts and fruit. I actually ran a poll on Instagram once and asked everyone what they thought about this reimagining of Gastornis. And well, I guess people just like their giant, flightless, carnivorous bird too much to accept anything else at this point. But for those of you who think that this is an attempt at neutering an apex predator, like that time some guy tried to slap the label of cowardly scavenger on T-Rex, just remember, we have a large flightless bird today that lives on a diet of fruit and seeds. And it's widely considered the most dangerous bird alive today. So if you think of Gastornis as a cassowary only four times bigger, suddenly it doesn't seem like such a downgrade by calling it a herbivore. But whether it fed on tiny horses or fruit, this was the first attempt that birds made to reclaim their ancestors' throne. But it would not be the last. The thing is, as we move forward from the Paleocene and Eocene, one group of animals' ability to rule the entire world was about to hit some difficulties that dinosaurs didn't have to face during the Mesozoic. By the end of the Eocene, there were three primary classes of vertebrate that were in the running for terrestrial dominance. The reptiles, the birds, and the mammals. But the thing is, the world they lived on was very different from the one that their ancestors lived on tens of millions of years ago. 
During the late Paleozoic and Mesozoic, animals could travel across one massive landmass on foot with no major obstacles in their way besides the occasional mountain range. During the Cenozoic, however, the supercontinent Pangaea had drifted apart, causing oceans to become natural barriers for the expansion of different animal groups. It no longer became achievable to take over the world, because it was all but impossible for any large-bodied organisms to spread across the entire globe. This became even more difficult at the beginning of the Oligocene, when the North and South Pole began to freeze. Now, for one thing, this would spell the end for an entire continent of terrestrial life. The ice also made travel between different landmasses more complicated as well. And it started to make certain regions of the world less suitable for some animal groups than others. So basically, from the Oligocene onward, the name of the game wasn't to take over the world, but to take over the region of the world that you could get to and that you were best adapted for. Some continents remained partly connected either permanently or periodically when the glaciers receded and sea levels still remained low enough. This was the case for pretty much the entire northern hemisphere and down into Africa. And because the drop in humidity made the global jungles disperse in favor of more open grassland and temperate woodland, the mammals did well across that entire region. Mammals with their endothermic metabolisms had an advantage over reptiles, and their ability to store body fat as insulation made them more well-suited to the colder regions than the birds. But the really interesting story is what was found on the two continents that were isolated from North America, Eurasia, and Africa. In Australia, after it broke away from Antarctica, this became the last continent to support a tropical rainforest across the majority of the landmass. And when it eventually started to dry out, it would be replaced by desert and scrubland. This environment proved to be perfectly suited to the giant, cold-blooded reptiles, and they were ready to take advantage of this. But for the purposes of answering the question posed to me that inspired this video, we'll need to shift focus to the other isolated landmass on the other side of the world. South America was in a similar situ... What do you want? Get away from me, you freaky little talking amoeba. Go! Shoo! Get! Yeah! Yeah! Hey everyone, this is Tim Tim. He's been following me around for the past week, so I decided to give him a name. I think this one's broken or something. Anyway, with that interruption out of the way, South America was in a similar situation to Australia in many ways. The last time it was connected to another landmass was when it pulled away from Antarctica. But instead of remaining a jungle and everything drying out into a desert, it largely became a tropical grassland. And I didn't mention this before, but there were still large mammals on both Australia and South America. But the dominance of the mammals wasn't as total on these continents because the climate and habitats didn't give them as big of an advantage as in the Northern Hemisphere. Here, the role of large herbivores would be filled by mammals like sloths, glyptodons, and strange ungulates like toxodon and macrochenia, but most of the carnivore roles were filled by a group of flightless birds called forest rockets, also known as terror birds. At a surface level, these birds bear a strong resemblance to the earlier flightless bird Gastornis, but like, in the same way that a Ford Pinto resembles a Lamborghini because they're both cars. Unlike with Gastornis, there is absolutely no question that these animals were active apex predators, with long legs that probably made them able to both run fast and kick like a horse, and a head like a battle axe with a hooked beak. They were basically a giant flightless bird of prey that could grow to several hundred pounds. So, in other words, a dinosaur. These guys would remain as the top predators of South America up until around two million years ago, when the isolation of this continent would come to an end. But that's a whole other story for another video at another time. I feel like I've said that a lot. So yeah, like I said, I could have just tried to answer this question in a reply to the comment, but I thought this would make a pretty great topic for a video. But the short answer is, dinosaurs did kind of try to re-evolve and regain dominance. And in some cases, for a while at least, 
they actually did. The problem was that because the continents weren't all connected like they were when the dinosaurs first spread out, it was much more difficult for any one class of animals to really rule the Cenozoic era. Mammals gained the best foothold across the north because they could still spread to two-thirds of the land, and they were more well adapted to the colder climate of the later Cenozoic. So I hope that gives a satisfactory answer to the question. I want to thank Nikolai Mishkin? I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize if I just butchered your name. For providing me with it, and I encourage anyone to comment below with their questions. I can't guarantee every single one will result in a video being made, but my goal here is to build a community of people who share a passion for natural history. And if something really stands out to me, I'll definitely still cover it. By all means, give me something to think about while I'm sitting here. Still stuck two and a half billion years in the past, waiting for me to hit the necessary sub count to evolve to my next form. Stuck here with Tim Tim. Yeah. Oh, Tim Tim. Yeah. I don't like you. Yeah. Yeah. But I love all of you. Thank you so much. I, in all honesty, I can't even believe how much my channel has grown, and I really appreciate it. Have a good one, everybody.